In Luke chapter 24. And we'll just read a little bit tonight. I, I really want to focus when I get to verse 13, but just to kind of put it, set, set it up. It's Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Friday night when we, when we had our Good Friday service, we talked about the timeline of the crucifixion and the trial and the, and, and the mock trial and the, and the beating and so forth. Chapter 24. Now upon the first day of the week, which was Sunday, the Feast of First Fruits in the Jewish calendar of holidays. Upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. They came to prepare the body for burial, as they would. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. We know that uh, in, in an effort to prevent the followers of Jesus from stealing the body, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the leaders, the high priest, told Pilate to put a, a, a guard there in front of the, the tomb. Well, they went there and the stone was rolled away. And they entered in and found not the body of Jesus Christ. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why are you looking for the living among the dead? So there's a whole message in that right there. There's a whole message. Why are people trying to find help in dead works? Why are people trying to find a solution to their problems by looking after dead works? I want the living Savior. I need the risen Christ. I can't find help for my situation in dead people. Or dead works. Or dead theology. Or dead church. God help me. I hope my church never goes dead. You ever been in a dead church? <laughs> I hope people aren't saying, yeah, I'm in one right now. I hope not. I don't want to be, I don't want to be dead church. I think when you, when you, when you look through in, in the Revelation, the, the letters to the seven churches, there's, there's a letter there to, a, to the church at Sardis. And those seven churches, and this is kind of a little off the, off the track, but those seven churches, I believe, represent different kinds of churches that you can find today. They also represent different church ages, or different ages of the church. But the, the church at Sardis was the dead church. Jesus said to that church, he says, there are those of you who were living but are now dead. What, what has happened to, to churches that at one time were like the cutting edge of the gospel? 200, 300 years ago where they had revivals and they would bring in preachers who would preach, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God and, and, and people would cry out and repent and bars would close and cities would be changed. Those same churches that used to have that kind of stuff now are ordained and homosexual. Now they're, are, they're saying, well, you don't really need, we can't really believe what the Word says. You can. They've, 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 they've died. They, still, they look like they're alive on the outside. But you can't find truth, you can't find help, you can't find life in death. Now that's a whole other message, and we're not going to preach that message tonight. He says, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and returned from the sepulcher, and told all these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, the mother, and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with him, which told these things unto the apostles. And the apostles said, You're crazy. He's not there. They didn't believe him. Interestingly, the women were the first missionaries. They were the first preachers of the gospel. Okay? Now, I read all that just to get here. It says in verse 12, Then Peter rose and ran into the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Okay, now, verse 13, here we are. Now this is what I always speak on, on Easter evening, Resurrection Day evening. Because it would be about this time of the day. You know, 6.30, 25 to 7. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus. The road to Emmaus, the Emmaus road. 
And these two were walking, heading home. It's about three square furlongs from Jerusalem. I think about six or seven miles. Verse 14. And as they were walking, they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. They ran into Jesus on this road to Emmaus. It's something how we can run into Jesus when we least expect him. You know, when you least expect it. When you think everything is lost, or you have your whole other agenda. This morning we talked about Paul, or Rabbi Saul, when he was on the road to Damascus. He was going to round up this, this, this uh, bunch of troublemakers. They weren't called Christians yet. But they were followers of the Nazarene. He was going up to round this bunch. And he, and he met Jesus on his road. But here these two, who were believers, they were going back to their home. And it says that they talked together of these things which had happened in verse 15. And it came to pass that while Jesus communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. They didn't recognize who he was. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk? And why are you so sad? Now every time I see a question that God asks, I always, I always bring this to light. When God asks a question, he already knows the answer. When he asked Adam, Adam, where are you? He knew where he was. When he said, Adam, what did you do? He knew what he did. Sometimes God comes to, uh, to, comes to us and he says, what are you doing? He said to Elijah, what are you doing here? When he was, Elijah was hiding in the cave. He knew where he was and what he was doing. Do you know God knows what you're involved in? He knows everything you're involved in. He knows what's going on in your head. He knows what you're turning over, and maybe nobody else. Man, and some of us, we learn how to put up a pretty good front. <laughs> I think if we would be allowed to see what goes on in some of the minds of people we know, man, we would be like really freaked out. And somebody, you might think this to yourself, man, if people knew what I was thinking sometimes, they would be freaked out. Come on. You know, we, have that, we have these minds. I do too, brother, I do. Sometimes, sometimes I find my mind wandering and the Holy Spirit gets a hold of me and I, I, I say, I better stop this. People don't know what I'm thinking, but you know what? God knows what I'm thinking. People don't know what you're thinking. He doesn't know, people don't know what, what's going on in your mind right now, but God knows. When he asks a question, he already knows the answer. But he wants to hear. He wants to hear from us. You know, sometimes unless we speak, he can't respond. Jesus says, why are you guys so sad? Why are you talking to each other like this? What's going on? And the one of them, whose name is Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Are you only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast not known uh, the things which are come to pass there in these days? Don't, haven't you heard what's gone on? Haven't you picked up the latest Jerusalem press? Didn't you hear about, haven't you heard, everybody in town is talking about it. This guy that claimed to be the Messiah. Jesus asked, and he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and in all the people. There was this fellow named Jesus, I guess you never heard of him. He did miracles. He raised people from the dead. There was a guy who was dead for four days and he brought him back to life. He marched into the city and everybody was welcoming him. We thought he was going to be the king. He says, and now the chief priests and our rulers have delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. We thought he was the guy who was going to buy us out of bondage. Well, he was the guy that bought him out of bondage. You see, when we get an idea fixed in our mind, 
when we figure out how God's going to do it, we got it all planned out. This is the way God's going to, here's my situation, here's my problem, this is the way God's going to do it. God, I'm just sitting back waiting, I'm believing, I got faith, oh God, I'm believing, I believe you're going to, I believe, I believe, I believe. And we find out God doesn't do it that way. And, and what we thought God was going to do blows up. Have you ever had a plan blow up? And you figured it was from God. <laughs> oh, this is the Lord. I know this is the Lord. A couple months later, you're thinking, what in the world happened? I've been there a few times. I've been there. Thought for sure. Prayed. Prayed. Oh, God. Fasted. Prayed. Sought the Lord. Read. Read books. Read scriptures. You know, uh, prayed the scripture. Had it all planned. Oh, God, here's, here's what. If we do this, God, then you can do this, and this will happen, and oh, everything's going to be just fine. And we start plugging things in, and the next thing we know, it's like, what happened? Well, that's where they were. They were convinced, not only these guys, but all the disciples of Christ, they were convinced beyond any doubt in their mind that Jesus was the promised Messiah. And he was. And is. But they just didn't understand God's plan. They didn't understand that God's purpose wasn't just to make Israel the capital of the world. God's purpose was to come and save sinners. His purpose was not political. And it is not political today. His purpose is salvation. His purpose is breaking hearts and planting the seed of God's word that it might grow and take root. That's what his purpose is. So they said, we thought that he was going to be our redeemer. And beside this, to top all this off, today is the third day since these things were done, and some of these crazy women came back and said his body wasn't there anymore. We don't know what's going on. And when they found not his body, they came in verse 23 saying, that they, had, that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. We don't know what's going on. His body's gone. He was beaten. I mean, we, we didn't expect our, the, the Messiah to be beat up and bruised and beaten with whips and crown of thorns and blood and dead. We didn't expect that. They were in a state of confusion. But they weren't confused because, you know, Jesus told them all this stuff was going to happen. If you read the Gospels, they just didn't listen. Sometimes when we find ourselves in a state of confusion, it's not because God, because God's not the author of confusion. It's because we haven't listened to him. When I find myself, you know, looking at stuff, at something that has blown up, something that I was counting on and trusting in, and it had just blown up, and it seems, like, it seems like everything is falling apart. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm confused. God says, you know what? If you would have just listened to me, you wouldn't be so confused. If you have just waited, there's something that we don't, we don't like. Just wait. We don't like to wait. If you had just waited and prayed and just waited, don't move until I say move. See, anytime, anytime I ended up in the midst of confusion is because I took a step before God told me to take a step. I presumed because I thought something looked good that it was good. I had it all figured out in my mind the way God was going to do things. So I take a step and I say, oh, this is the Lord, this is the Lord. And then boom, right? They were confused. They didn't know what to expect. They didn't know why. They couldn't explain why there wasn't a body. And Jesus spoke to them and he said, O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now there was no New Testament written at this time. They didn't have the book of Romans, they didn't have Ephesians, they didn't have Corinthians, they didn't have... They, those, those hadn't been written yet. But Jesus, remember we said this morning, he, 
was crucified, buried, and risen again according to the Scriptures. The Old Testament Scriptures. The Old Testament Scriptures. Some folks say, oh, the Old Testament is... The Old Testament speaks of Christ. Amen. Salvation in the Old Testament, you know what? It's exactly as it is in the New Testament. We're saved by faith. Hasn't changed. They just didn't know as much as we know now. They didn't have the revelation of God, the completion, the, the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Jesus Christ. They, God spoke to them. It says that Abraham, when Paul wanted to use an example of salvation by faith, he, who did he use? Did he use Peter? Did he use James or John or Mary? No, he used Abraham. Old Testament. When Peter said, or when, when Jesus was saying, don't you understand what the prophets have spoken? He wasn't talking about Jude or James or John. He was talking about Isaiah, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, Job, Genesis, Moses. He says, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Don't you understand? The Old Testament speaks of a suffering Savior. Friday night we read from Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And it talks about how Christ was, when, when they looked upon him, they didn't think anything, there was nothing special about him. Forget the pictures you see of the guy with a halo around his head. He was just, he didn't look any different than anybody else. He was just a, a normal guy. And they thought he was crazy. Some of them did. And he was beaten, he was bruised. Stripes were laid on his back. He was pierced. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. It, it speaks of that in the Old Testament. And Jesus says, listen, have you, have you never read that? You know, just last week we went to a meeting, uh, in a globe meeting, where there's a fellow there named Abraham Sandler who is a Messianic Jew. He's a, he's a Jewish Christian. And he said, you know, in synagogues today, they don't read Isaiah chapter 53. They bypass it. Because they can't explain it. He was, he was giving a testimony of his father, who was an Orthodox Jew, and uh, who was uh, really treat, mistreated by certain Christians. And yet, when, when, he, when somebody presented him Isaiah chapter 53, he read that, he said, he thought they were, they were reading something out of the New Testament. He said, no, that's from Isaiah. In, in the book of Acts, when Philip was ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch, he was reading out of Isaiah chapter 53, and he asked Philip, who is this that this is talking about? Jesus says, Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I wonder if we went all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 where Jesus said that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's seed. I wonder if we went, if we went all the way back, I, I wonder if we went back to when Joshua and, uh, uh, surrounded the city of Jericho and Rahab the harlot hung that, that red thread out of, her, out of her window to protect her and her family under the blood. I wonder if we talked about that. I wonder if we talked about how God arranged it so that Ruth, a Moabitess, would come and marry a, a man named Boaz and be, be included in the lineage of the Messiah. I wonder if he went through all the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53, and all the prophecies in, 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 in the Old Testament about the coming, the branch. Jeremiah talked about the one who would come, the branch. Jehovah's branch. Jehovah's righteousness. Jehovah's king. That seven mile walk was a long walk, and Jesus could, he could, he could say a lot of things during that time. It says that he expounded unto them all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh to the village where they went, and he made as though he would go further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent, maybe in just a couple hours from now, maybe 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, it's getting dark, it's been a long walk. They said, Stay with us. And he went into tarry with them, in verse 30, and it came to pass as he sat and meet with them, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke and gave it to them. And then their eyes were open. So he could have opened their eyes anywhere along that trip 
anywhere along that journey, Jesus could have revealed himself to them. But he waited. He waited until he had a chance to explain to them everything they needed to know. And then when he took that bread and broke it, it doesn't say here he said anything, but we know on the night before he was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. You see, he took that long walk, those two men with broken hearts and confused and just... That's when Christ could reveal himself to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said to one another, when he was speaking to us, didn't our hearts burn? They realized that the anointed word of God, that this, this the, the God in the flesh was speaking to them once again. They didn't recognize it. But once he was gone, they said, that was him. They said, man, we can't take this, keep this to ourselves. So they got up. It was late. But they said, man, we can't keep this to ourselves. We got to do some overtime here. <laughs> and he went back. They made that long walk back to Jerusalem. So we got we got to tell them what we saw. They couldn't keep it in. Well, let's just let's just sleep and we'll go back tomorrow. No, they couldn't keep it in. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together with them that were with them saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way. By this time, Peter had seen him. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. And as they thus spoke, see, here's, here's, here's what it all comes down to. Here's the message for tonight. Friday, suffering. Or crucifixion, which I think was probably before Friday, but suffering. Three days, just imagine the disciples and these, with those, for those three days when he was buried in the tomb, they were probably afraid and they were probably hiding in fear for their own lives. They had betrayed him. They left him. Peter, just imagine what he was going through. Old brave Peter. Denied him with a curse. Just put yourself in this place that you have been there. Have you ever, have you ever denied God? Have you ever turned your, turned your back on God? Have you ever, have you ever dumped him? Peter dumped them. Amen. Have you ever dumped God? Well, it's just not expedient. I just, I, I'm busy. I, 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 don't want, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want people to be mad at me. I don't... I, I don't I, just imagine how he felt. How they all felt. They all ran, with the exception of John. He was the only one that was hanging around the cross. The beloved disciple. All of a sudden they start hearing that Jesus is alive. And they don't know what to make of it. And here they are all in one place. And Jesus shows up. And he says, peace. Isn't it something that when you're in the midst of your confusion, in the midst of something that's blown up, in the midst of your, your, your biggest plans and, and proudest plans and, and the things that you're certain of and everything just blows up and everything just... Is nothing like you expected. And when you think everything is a mess, Jesus shows up. And he says, peace. Peace in the midst of the storm. Peace. See, that's what this is all about. That's why we can rejoice in our Savior. Because Jesus speaks peace. That's why it's okay what they're doing, what they're going to do in Washington or who wins the election or if they're going to take the Ten Commandments down or whatever they're going to do. It's, listen, it's okay because Jesus says peace. That's not what we had planned. That's not what we would like to see. We would like to see some other things happen. I would like to see our government be a different way. I would like to see somebody else in office. I would like to see this. I would like, it doesn't matter. They had Nero. And he said peace. I don't want a Nero. He was crazy. And he said, peace. See, this is something that we have to rejoice. We should rejoice. And we should glorify God. Because we have peace.
We have peace. No matter what happens. It says that they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. But he wasn't a spirit. Some of these cults will say that was a spirit. That's not a spirit. He said, why are you troubled and why do you, these thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me. For see, uh, uh, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see me have. He says, here I am. Look, feel me, touch me. Flesh and bones. Interesting he didn't say flesh and blood. This morning we talked about the resurrection. And talked about resurrected bodies. And we really didn't get into the detail of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 so much. But you know, when, when my body's resurrected, someday if, if, if the rapture doesn't happen before I die, and they bury my body... And when the trump sounds and the dead in Christ raise, you know what? I'm not going to need any blood anymore. You know why? Because right now, the life is in the what? In the blood. If you lose all your blood, you're going to... No. But in our resurrected body, the life is in the spirit. It's not in the blood anymore. And you know what? You might be able, they might be able to take your blood out of you, but they'll never take the Spirit of God out of you. They'll never take the Spirit of God out of you. So that's why we have hope tonight. That's why I hope tonight you press your way out to church. I hope that you leave tonight with, with, with the knowledge in your head, with just a little bit more hope than you had when you came in. Because I know many of us, sometimes we've got things going on in our lives, and we shake our head and we say, God, what is going to come of this? We've all been there. And we'll be there again. And you know something I found out? The older you get, it does not get easier. It doesn't get easier. The older you get, doesn't get easier. But God is in control. Amen? He's speaking peace tonight. In your situation, in your turmoil, in your confusion, in your whatever has exploded in your life, God is saying peace. In this world you'll have trouble. Jesus said, but I have overcome the world. There's a song that we sing. It's a peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Where are you on your road to Emmaus? On your road to Damascus. Where are you on your road? Have you, have you got face to face with Jesus yet? You will. You will. When you get to that place when you just can't understand anything, Jesus is going to show up. You might not recognize him at first. But that's okay. He'll let you know who he is. And what he's done and where he's come from. And what he's going to do. I thank God that we have a God like that. I don't have to bow to him five times a day. I don't have to make a trip to wherever. All I got to do is say, Lord, go boldly to his throne. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Why don't you stand with me as we close? We wish, I wish you all a great resurrection day. Let the life of Christ be in you. Keep your ears open. Keep your eyes open. He wants to let you know. He, I mean, he's, he's on your road. He's walking with you. He just wants us to listen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you, Lord, that as we're on our road to Emmaus, as we're on our road, some of us, Father, we're walking and we're thinking, Lord, what in the world has happened? Father, you know what's happened. I pray, Father, that the peace of God that passes understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Father, help us, Lord, pray. Help us be willing to, to tell you everything. Help us, Lord, if we, if we think we're keeping something from you, Father, convict us. Help us, Lord, to pour ourselves out to you. 
that you might hear. Even the things that we know you don't like. It says if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, and I pray for peace in the lives of these ones in this, in this room tonight. Father, whatever turmoil they're going through, whatever, whatever confusion is in their life, Father, I pray that you would speak peace to them. And let them know that you know their situation, you know everything about them, and that their lives are in your hands. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Father, we thank you and we give you glory. Bring us back at the appointed time. Keep us safe on our way home. And help us give you glory in everything. Father, help us tell somebody about Jesus this week. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Shake somebody's hand. Have a wonderful week this week. God bless you all.